there's a rather significant piece of the story missing today in that part we just heard from the 8th chapter of Mark's Gospel. So we've got to rewind and pick that up. The story actually begins four verses earlier when we hear this. Jesus went with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and others one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he, Jesus, sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Okay, got that? Peter, you are the Messiah. You are the man. You're the one we've been waiting for. Messiah. That is one loaded identity. For a people who had grown accustomed to a foreign power lording it over them, holding them down under their thumb, there was a whole lot of hope pinned to this Messiah who was going to restore them to the top place, to winner status, to the glory days when David was king and the kingdom was strong. Jesus was their ticket up and out. So what Jesus says next comes as a bit of a shock. And then Jesus began to teach his disciples that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said this all quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Wow. First, Jesus doesn't claim the Messiah title for himself. He only talks about the Son of Man. And actually the translation is Son of Anthropos. Son of human being, son of humanity. It's not even capitalized. Allusions to son of man image from the book of Daniel aside, Peter elevates Jesus. But Jesus, Jesus claims absolute and total solidarity with all of humanity. And that the one must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and scribes and be killed. For Peter, this was anathema. Now, Peter has the good sense to put on what, what we might consider his best southern manners. He knows not to call Jesus out in front of his disciples. So he takes Jesus aside privately, begins to rebuke him, but Jesus would have none of it. He turns and looks at his disciples and rebukes Peter, even calls him Satan, the adversary, and tells Peter to get behind him. And with a piercing clarity, Jesus declares to Peter, you're setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. You think this is all about a climb to the top? You think this is all about regaining position and status? That's the false self, Peter. That's the way human beings move in the world. But that is not the way of God. Solidarity, Peter. Solidarity with God. Solidarity with all of humanity. Position, power, prestige, privilege, status. This is the currency of the elders and chief priests and scribes. This is always the currency of those on top. And anyone who stands apart from these will suffer and be rejected and be killed. Remember, Jesus had wrestled with the temptations of the false self in the wilderness. 
Jesus had made peace with the path that was his to walk. Clearly, Peter still had a ways to go. And probably so do we. And Jesus wants us to be crystal clear about the path that he is laying out before us. Unlike credit card companies and mortgage lenders, he's giving us the fine print up front and writ large. Hear the text again. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. There's a lot here. First, the paradox to end all paradoxes. When you try to save your life, you lose it. When you lose it for Jesus' sake and for the sake of the gospel, you save it. Back to the trusty Richard Rohr picture. This is probably the closest I will ever come to doing a sermon series, and it was not intentional. My Methodist friends would be proud. It seems we've got to keep working deeper with this teaching. So what if we think of this false self as the small self, as our small life? And when we think that this little life will save us, when we think that our roles and identities and accomplishments and failures, when we think that our position and status and power and prestige and privilege are the things that will make us whole, then we lose our capacity to discover and taste the wholeness that is truly whole. That wholeness that is truly worthy of the word salvation. That truly is the life that is alive. Instead of an imitation of life, which is what many of us settle for. But when we can lose this small life, when we can shed all these layers and masks, all this armor that we use to shore up this small life, when we can lose that and give ourselves over to simply abiding with Jesus and the good news of this unshakable union with God that Jesus manifests so beautifully, and that he promises is ours if we will just open our eyes to it. When we can lose this and give ourselves over to this, we discover the wholeness that truly is life, capital L. Remember, save is connected to salvation, is connected to healing, is connected to wholeness. They all share the same root word. And we know it's true. You can gain a whole lot by the world's standards and completely forfeit your life in the process. This is the old, it looks really good on the outside, but is painfully empty on the inside scenario. And this life that is rooted and grounded in union with God and divine love, you can't give anything in return for it. This world over here, it's always trying to sort out position, power, prestige, position, privilege, status. It's always transactional. It's always trading this for that. It's always measuring. It's always keeping score. But this life, all you can do is collapse back into it. You can't give anything in return for it because it's all gift. All you can do is be awake to it. All you can do is be present to it, drink of it, and share it. This last piece is challenging. 
After a week of training in Brene Brown's work on shame and vulnerability, I am not sure at all what to make of Jesus saying that those who are ashamed of him and his words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in glory. It does seem that adulterous and sinful accurately describe the world of the false self. This little life does experience itself as cut off, separate, and that self acts in all kinds of ways that miss the mark as it tries to assert its place. An adulteress, well, the false self does have a certain amount of allure to it, a certain amount of adrenaline. This world can be a real rush as you're climbing to the top and falling down and conquering it again. This true self world, it's characterized by peace, equanimity, contentment. It is solid. But to this addicted small self over here, it feels mighty boring. It's tempting to forsake this union for the rush of this little life over here. And when you've invested a whole lot of time and energy succeeding and climbing in the world, then it's pretty easy to look down and be ashamed of this world, where striving, A, gets you absolutely nowhere, and B, doesn't even exist. So that much I can sort of make sense of. But I can't get my head around the son of humanity, the one who lives in complete awareness of this union with God. I can't get my head around that one being ashamed of anyone when he comes in glory. The only way I could possibly get my head around it is to think of what shame is. Again, according to Brene Brown, shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. Maybe Jesus is saying that this false self world is flawed because you can't ever really belong here, not truly, because it's simply too unstable and insecure. It's the house built on sand. For Jesus, true belonging happens here and only here, in union with God and with all that is. But even this way of understanding it presses this to the outer limit. I still don't like Jesus using shame as a strategy for changing hearts. The research shows Shame doesn't transform people. Faith knows that only love, unconditional love, can do that. So let's pan out just a bit. This exchange with Peter and the disciples and the crowd, it happens in Caesarea Philippi. Now that's as far north as you can get in Israel. And this represents the farthest north that Jesus will travel in his ministry. Once he turns south from here, he is bound for Jerusalem. The cross of which he speaks here in Caesarea Philippi will become his lived reality there in Jerusalem. I think it's quite possible that some more refinement, as in refiner's fire, is yet to come for Jesus as he passes through the trials of being betrayed and denied and abandoned and forsaken. Something more is yet to be deepened in Jesus' being. Death and resurrection will do that. Because when he, when he emerges on the other side of this, he doesn't speak of shame, but only of forgiving love. See the exchange with Peter in John 21. 
I'd like to think that if Jesus were speaking these words from Mark 8 to Peter and the disciples and the crowds by the Sea of Galilee about 50 days from now, having lived through his cross, having given himself over to death, having yielded to resurrection life, I would like to think that shame would not be his go-to strategy, but instead only the language and way of reconciling love and forgiveness. So on this second Sunday in Lent, what pieces of your small life are you trying desperately to save? And how are you losing your big life in the process? And if you were to lose, if you were to shed, if you were to lay aside, if you were to loosen your grip on this little life, what wholeness might you discover in this larger life that catches you when you finally turn loose and let go of the small life? What might you discover as you free fall into the hands of the living God? Saving is losing. Losing is saving. It's the paradox to end all paradoxes. But within it lies the path to the only life worth living.